Specifications are 15, age 15. They hope to reach it, but for the science verification, they cannot guarantee it, so they set this to age 14. So. I still see two of my group are still I see. <laughs> We should not wait for them.
A weekly edition of the IIA scientific seminar. <laughs> I'm pleased to see you all here gathering in great masses. And uh, our guest, special guest today is Dr. Michael Hilke from ESO, the European Southern Observatory, from headquarters in Garching. Um, I've known him for him already for a few years. He, by the way, he speaks fluently Spanish. So, and um, we have an intense relation now because uh, my student Paco spent nine months with a, as an ESO student fellow, and uh, Michael was his local tutor. So Michael got his PhD degree in 1998 at the University of Bonn in Germany with Richtler Thomas. Tom Richtler, sorry. And actually it was there where he discovered the ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. So he has actually discovered and named an object that came out in 1999. Okay. <laughs> an object class, not an object, a whole class of object. Uh, then he went on, he was from 1999 to 2001 at the Universidad Católica in Chile. One of the first postdocs... Uh, yes. And if you remember, that was just when the VLT was starting. I think the first VLT opened in 1999, basically. So, so that was golden times there. You got lots of observing time in Chile. It was very nice. Then Michael went back to Bonn to a kind of, it's not, not directly postdoctoral position, halfway to a professorship to habilitation, where he was until 2006, when he then went to ESO and got tenured at ESO in 2012. <laughs> Typically at ESO, after three plus three years, then you become tenured. There he works uh, in the user support department, so where you, they typically have 50% of the time for user support, 50% for science. He's, he's the face behind the, one of the faces behind the anonymous USD at ESO, USD support at ESO, when you have problems. And um, you have to really appreciate the work because I, I appreciate the work and it's super interruptive work because they have to guarantee an answer between, I think, 48 hours. And so basically, whenever you do something, cling another email and you have to stop everything. And so, so that's, that's heavy work. He's uh, responsible for KMOS, for FORCE, for Vimos. surveys, VMOS and CRIRES. So, also the survey instruments, VST. Yeah. So, so it's, it's good to know him. <laughs> and I will get Muse actually from uh, now on. Well. I will also be responsible for Muse, so <laughs> it's very good to, to have a face uh, to that. Uh, um, not much more to say. We work, he, Michael works on ultra compact dwarf galaxies, which is kind of a natural bridge also to supermassive black holes and to nuclear star clusters. This is why we work together too. And uh, yeah, I stop talking now and uh, really leave the stage to you. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Rainer. So I, I enjoy my visit very much here. It's um, well, a nice institute and a very nice city. <laughs> I enjoyed this very much. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about maybe a class of objects you're not all aware of uh, here. Uh, but the relation is, uh, as uh, Rainer already said, maybe also to nuclear star clusters and also to supermassive black holes. So um, I first start. So this, these are the galaxies we know, right? This is a kind of a modern Hubble diagram, I would say. If you, if you point here, maybe the mass in this direction and star formation action activity in this direction, we know all these early type galaxies that don't form stars, right? The giant ellipticals in the cluster centers, down to the dwarf spheroids we know in our local group, and then all the kind of spirals and gaseous galaxies that form um, locally and in groups and so on. And most of these galaxies, at least uh, above a certain mass limit, possess uh, supermassive black holes first, and most of them, 70%, also a nuclear star cluster that looks like a big globular cluster, right? Uh, up to the 10 to the 8 solar masses, 10 to 6, 7, 8 solar masses. We know this case in our Milky Way. 
So what I'm concentrating on is a continuation to here, to lower masses, where you know maybe compact ellipticals. Then there comes this new class. I will introduce you to the ultra-compact dwarfs and the global clusters themselves, right? And, well, this continues here. And um, so just uh, be because of the discovery, they are, uh, they are researchers that are interested in the most compact galaxy you find. So they might ask, what is the smallest compact galaxy? They're coming down this route. My PhD thesis was more about, global, I'm a global cluster researcher, what is the largest global cluster coming up from here? So there uh, starts a, a discovery history, um, how these objects were detected. So this is now a plane where you put here absolute magnitude, you can take also stellar mass with the highest mass objects here, and a size in logarithmic form here, the effective radius, the half mass radius. And this was the situation before the discovery you had this, all these giant ellipticals, uh, very well known from works of Bender and so on. In the local group, you had the dwarf ellipticals. Now, we had some compact ellipticals, M32 was always known, and you had the global clusters around the Milky Way uh, in this plane. So then, um, I started in my PhD a work to look in the Fornax cluster of galaxies, which is a nearby galaxy cluster in the southern um, uh, hemisphere and found uh, somewhere, uh, not always in close to galaxies, some objects that resemble, uh, resemble more or less like globular clusters. They were barely resolved. There you see a little envelope. Uh, I took radial velocity and confirmed that they are in the Fornax cluster. They're not foreground stars. They were pretty bright. So they were pretty massive, uh, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, even 10 to the 8 solar masses, this thing. Then from the other side, there came at the same time uh, the galaxy researcher. This was a group uh, around uh, Michael Drinkwater in Australia who did also a spectroscopic survey trying to find uh, all the compact galaxies in these clusters. And they were the first, actually, they named these objects as ultra-compact dwarf. And then I told them I found them before. Um, <laughs> I, I, and in my, in, my, in my work here, I just called them, oh, these are interesting objects that might be either the most massive global cluster could be compact uh, dwarf galaxies, or could be also the remnants stripped nuclei of, of more massive galaxies. So I had already in mind all these three, but I didn't put it on a big bell, and that's why they called now uh, UCDs, ultra-compact dwarfs. Also, we don't still know whether they are really dwarf galaxies. So this was then the situation in 2000. They came in here. So and that's very interesting. They follow this elliptical path here, and, 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 and really fill in this space going from global clusters up to the, to the galaxies, filling the space that was before empty, right? And, and so how do you find them in the first place? So, so um, they are mostly found in galaxy clusters. I take here as an example the Hydra clusters, and it's not, not so easy. You can make photometry of point sources in this because they will not be resolved. And these are all the point sources in, in this field I show here. This was a force observation I did. Uh, and, and then you can ask yourself, the red ones are the ones that are not resolved, that, are, that can be these globular clusters, and this is typical, they have these colors here, they have uh, blue and red globular clusters. Then you do a spectroscopic follow-up of, of all these uh, objects with a lot of multi-mask uh, spectra, and then you find among a tons of foreground stars members of the cluster, and then you see they're popping up at, 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 at brightnesses, here, some members, but most of them are mostly uh, uh, foreground stars. But then you find uh, these are like needles in a haystack, one, two, three, four, that are above a limit that is 10 to the 7 solar masses. And then you can uh, put them also in a spatial plot and, and things like that. That's how they are mostly found. It's, it's quite intensive to go through radial velocity surveys because most people have ignored before. They said, oh, these are anyway foreground stars. We don't take them and so on. That's how they found. So this is another example. You have a giant elliptical. You subtract uh, the image. These are all these point sources. These are thousands of global clusters. But the ones that are more massive than Omega Centauri, for example, are these ones in the red circles here. So these are then the confirmed so-called UCDs. So many people jumped on this topic. And uh, in 2010, the situation was already like this, that you added to a lot of surveys also in the Milky Way, the, the very faint dwarf spheroidal galaxies, more global clusters, they're coming up more and more ultra-compact dwarfs. And if you put, and this uh, brings me now to the point of the nuclear star clusters, at the same time people were looking at nuclear star clusters in external galaxies. These are some of the groups here. 
And, and if you fill this up, they fill the same space, amazingly. Uh, and, and so there, this was the idea that some of these UCDs that are now apart, that are not in the galaxies, and these are the nuclear star clusters that are still in the galaxies, might be uh, the same sort of objects. Okay? So, um, and just, so we have this name ultra compact dwarfs, but there were different people finding in this plane, in this preliminary gap that was there all the time different kind of objects and naming them all kind of faint fuzzies, um, ultra faint dwarfs, compact ellipses. So they, uh, there's a lot of confusion in this whole um, area, how they were called. But for me, it's, it's just, I'm interested what are those guys. How they are called is not important. Maybe they are strip nuclei, maybe they are just the extension of global clusters. But I, I will concentrate on, on this regime, everything that is more massive then Omega Centauri, I would say something 10 to the 6 up to 10 to the 8, and that is a little bit extended. There seems to be a natural limit here where no object can be denser as, as this line. This is basically a density line here in, in this plot. Uh, oh, yeah, so density. So I, then you can plot the same, so the, the mass of these objects against the effective surface density, so the dens stellar mass density within half mass radius. And this is then very obvious now that you have here is uh, all the galaxy class. This is a family of galaxies, giant ellipticals down to dwarf ellipticals. This is the, all the globular clusters here. And, and then you see here in green and blue maybe that these are nuclear star clusters still in galaxies. They are among the densest objects because they are, they are really confined. They are massive and have a, a small half-light radius. And, and if you say these are basically the UCDs, so they are actually not so, so ultra compact in terms of, of these objects. Uh, in terms of galaxies, they are... In terms of galaxies, maybe they are ultra compact because these are the galaxies, so they, are, they, are, they have a high density. But in terms of a star cluster, they are rather diffuse, actually. Right? And, and they fall here, they overlap here with some of the nuclear star clusters. Interestingly, also, if you, if you uh, calculate the uh, relaxation time of a dynamical stellar object and uh, equate it to the Hubble time, this is just the, the line here. So UCDs are not really relaxed stellar systems, um, they are still um, evolving, uh, and global cluster are mostly relaxed objects. Okay, so what can we learn about else about uh, UCD? So the, we, we want to know the observational uh, parameters of those. In principle, you can do two things. Because they are so far away and, and not resolved, uh, you can just take them as an ensemble in the environment and try to find out uh, how they are distributed, uh, what, uh, so their spatial distribution, what is their mass spectrum, what is their dynamics if you have radial velocities around the host galaxy. You maybe from the color get a metallicity distribution and maybe with HST even a size distribution and a specific frequency. How many UCDs are there per galaxy mass, let's say. And so that's what we can learn we, with the link of the UCTs to their host, the formation channel maybe, and, and how they evolve in the galaxy or cluster environment. So, but if you are brave and take some of the UCDs that are really only one, two arc seconds on sky, you can take them and you can try to infer some internal properties. You can still, as an unresolved point source, from the luminosity in color, get their stellar mass. You can get an internal velocity dispersion if I have a high resolution spectra, like we did this with UVIS, for example, and get a dynamical mass compared to the stellar mass. And you can try via some lick indices measurements to get some ideas of the, of the uh, metallicity or even the age. But if you can spatially resolve a UCD, and this will be now possible with, with MUSE, for example, with a narrow femur, you can get the surface brightness profile, which is ACST. You can even get maybe a color profile, a velocity dispersion profile, and you can then start also to ask, is there dark matter, is there nuclear, is there a massive black hole inside? And you can even, if you, uh, if you are at a four megaparsec distance, can try to resolve them into single stars in the outside. I tried with HST several times, there is one around Sombrero, this would be possible, but they, they don't like it. So, <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, so and then we can even learn from the individual UCDs how they are built up. Okay, to explain this once more, 
Um, so we have in our Milky Way Omega Centauri, which is the most massive star clusters, and we know the, um, very well that it has multiple stellar populations with met uh, different metallicities, maybe even an age difference. But already if we go to Andromeda, there is one very big star cluster, G1. We can still get a color magnitude diagram. We can do some things there. But then the typical where they are in Centaurus A in the Fornax cluster, they are of size of 1.5 arc seconds or 2 arc seconds, the most massive one. And then it gets really difficult to get uh, uh, internal properties of, of those. Okay. So this is more or less what can be done in observations. But... Um, so there were some ideas, theoretical ideas, what they might be. So they, they come up, different people, with UCD formation scenarios, right? And there are basically two ideas. The first idea is that they are built up from, from a star cluster formation process, that they are basically star clusters, very big ones. So they are just the tip of the mass spectrum of a star cluster population. Because in the Fornax cluster, there is a giant elliptical, and we know that this giant elliptical... Uh, once formed with very high star formation rate in a star burst. And in this star burst, there might just be more massive global clusters than we know in the Milky Way. So this might be just, just more global clusters. So, and interestingly, now, um, uh, in the last five years, there are some high, uh, infra, uh, high uh, redshift observations of lensed uh, blobs of star formation that narrow them down to a few parsec, so they, 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 they might see actually massive global cluster formation already. Um, or they found, in, uh, they are formed like in mergers, you might know the antenna galaxy, and I will come to this, uh, they are super star cluster complexes, and if you merge them together, they would also look like, uh, like here, so they, this is an antenna galaxy, and in the overlap reaching you have these super star cluster complexes. Each of these is a is a massive star cluster, right? And if you merge them together, and there are some theoretical models, if you merge such a complex together, you get a kind of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 uh, solar mass object that looks like, when it's aging, like an ultra-compact dwarf galaxy. And indeed, so there were also some young massive cluster studies, and if you take the same mass size plane, they overlap very nicely between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8 uh, uh, with the UCD population. So in principle, even in the local universe, in, in uh, star-forming galaxies uh, or in emerging galaxies, you can form, the, form this very high-mass star clusters on the spot without being a special uh, 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 scenario. Also, in galaxy clusters, you might know cooling flows. Uh, there are condensations within cooling flows that build very young objects that are um, also in the mass regime of, of these ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. Okay, so, but I will concentrate mostly now on the second uh, formation channel, which is they are remnants of disruptive galaxy evolution processes, right? So they were located, these UCDs were located in the center of the host galaxies. They are their nuclear star clusters. And then they follow the formation history of the nuclear star clusters. Or they might even be related then to dark matter substructure. So to do infalling dwarf galaxies uh, that disrupt it and leave the nucleus there. So we know that this happens because dwarf galaxies exist in large numbers in galaxy clusters and also around the Milky Way. And around 70% of them have nuclear in their centers. And we have a very famous example in front of our house. This is actually the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy disrupting in the Milky Way. And it has a very prominent central star cluster, M54. Uh, and these star clusters uh, will stay as a remnant uh, in this galaxy. And, and there are other uh, examples in, in the Virgo cluster, for example, or, or around massive galaxies, where you see in tidal tails of disrupting galaxy uh, prominent nucleus. So these are the smoking guns of uh, um, really disruption processes where you see that this uh, process is happening, right? So uh, there will be nuclear star cluster remnants uh, staying there. And there's a whole bunch of of works that suggested already that the stripping or threshing scenario, that this process leads to um, some of the, our global clusters uh, and maybe UCDs. So this goes back to Seneca in 1988. And I'm involved in this last work. So Joel Pfeffer was one of my students at ESO as well. 
we did some work together with Holger Baumgart where we uh, looked in this disruption process and how, this, how many um, UCDs we can expect to come from this stripping process. So the thing is that you set up a dwarf galaxy in uh, your simulations with a nuclear star cluster and let them evolve in a galactic potential and then uh, even within typically two to four giga years you will disrupt, you will lose all the envelope so the mass of the envelope goes down, whereas the mass of the nucleus does not change a lot. And that's how you can build up an isolated nucleus. Um, and if you want to see this in the surface brightness profile of one individual dwarf galaxy, you start with a normal profile of a nucleus plus an envelope, let's say uh, an exponential envelope, and within, this is in two giga years, you are already in the, in the uh, observational limits where you would not see any more the envelope that is dissolved and see only the naked nuclei um, remaining. If you do this in, in this uh, mass size plot, then you can really see that these uh, this, uh, simulations lead to the region where we find these UCDs. So here you have a nucleated dwarf elliptical, if you strip it, the nucleus will end up in this region where we expect it. Or in the mass size plane, the same game, you come from here and uh, build this isolated nuclei. Okay, as I explained already, we have uh, a lot of, um, of these UCDs in, in uh, clusters around it, so we can ask the question, um, how often does it happen, really? Um, is this process the... Um, dominating process to build these UCDs. And what we did there, uh, together with my student Joel Pfeffer, um, we took the Millennium situ uh, simulations, one of these big uh, cosmological simulations, we looked in a typical cluster environment, um, we took the similar analytical model that were at that time available, looked for the position of disrupted galaxies, and then um, ad hoc we put on these galaxies uh, a nuclear fraction and also, um, well, we assume that most of these galaxies have a nuclei. We, we know that 70% have a nuclei. We know more or less the mass fraction of a typical nucleus of these galaxies and then followed all these uh, strip nuclei and looked at their positions. So this is, is one of our assumptions that with galaxy Mars here, the nucleation fraction is very high, up to 10 to the 8, or to more or less here, and then goes slightly down. These are really the dwarf galaxies. And then in the simulations we saw that um, more or less 40% of the initial, uh, initially available satellites in the simulations are disrupted nowadays, right? So, and we followed these ones and then can, in dependence of the mass of the nucleus that remains and the cluster virial mass, so these are typical Virgo, Fornax clusters here, say how many stripped nuclei we would expect according to a certain mass limit here. And then compare this to observations. And we can even say in the simulations they should look like the, the spatial distribution in a typical Virgo or Fornax cluster should look like this, with certain mass limits. Okay. Um, so we have we have these observations in the Fornax cluster, where we have a lot of radial velocities. This is part of my PhD thesis, um, um, and we can see that depending on the mass of this ultra compact dwarf or globular cluster, the spatial distribution. A typical finding is that in, the, uh, in, in a galaxy cluster, the so-called metal-rich red global clusters are mostly concentrated towards the galaxy, to the, the central galaxy. These, these were formed probably when the bulge of the, of the giant elliptical was formed, then followed by the blue global clusters, which are metal poor, and then I put here some mass ranges like Omega Centauri mass, and ultra-compact dwarf 10 to the 7 solar masses, they are not as concentrated as the normal global clusters, and, um, but more concentrated than the normal dwarf elliptical galaxies in the cluster. And if you put the simulations on top of it, which are these dashed lines, they follow very nicely this UCD. So we can, in the simulations, really explain that the most massive global clusters, or UCDs as you would call them, 10 to the 7 solar masses, 
uh, can be re reproduced by simulations. Or in another way, one can show this also as a mass spectrum. So this is a number of global clusters and ultra-compact dwarf galaxies as observed here in this step function, in, the, in this histogram. And these are our predictions from simulations where you can see that above 10 to the 7, more or less, we can, most of the observed objects can be explained by strip nuclei. But if you go down to an Omega Centauri, uh, mass, only 20% of UCDs could be strip nuclei. So we would not expect that every uh, big global cluster we see in an environment is a strip nucleus, only maybe 20% of those with omega centauri masses. If you go to the Milky Way, we can do the same game. We, we predicted that we uh, would uh, only uh, expect more or less three global clusters to come from a, from a um, stripping process and we know that there are some global clusters, especially the Omega Centauri and M54, uh, I mentioned already, probably are strip nuclei. And um, our results is compatible with four, or more or less in our halo, four global clusters coming from this stripping scenario. Okay. So, but how can we, as an individual UCD, know which one is actually uh, a strip nucleus? Um, and in principle, I think there are three ways how we can try to find out whether uh, one of these ultra-compact dwarfs is a strip nuclear. So we can look for UCDs that are embedded still in tidal tails or extended envelopes, or even have some companion global clusters around them. There's always a little but. Because also in this uh, antenna scenario, uh, if you have seen it, there are a lot of global clusters or star clusters that form one big object. They can be, in principle, um, still companion uh, rest uh, star clusters around it. Or also a, global, a big global cluster, in principle, could have tidal tails if it is dissolved. A second way to try to find out whether these are strip nuclei is to show that they have a spread in heavy element abundances. Because so far, no global cluster has been shown to have a spread in iron abundance. In light element abundance, yes, but not in an iron abundance. But then there are also theories, a little but is always that there come people that say they, every global cluster that forms above 10 to the 6 is self-shielding, can bring back material to form a second generation, and then you are again in this game, is this only in a nuclear environment possible, or might this be also be possible for a global cluster? But one of the most powerful um, indicators is maybe that uh, they possess supermassive black holes because this would, you would really only explain in, uh, uh, in, in galaxies because there is this famous uh, galaxy uh, mass uh, black hole relation. So let's look at these indicators. What do we uh, find actually? So let's look at tidal debris around uh, ultra compact dwarfs. So the idea is the following. You have a nucleated galaxy, let's say a dwarf elliptical galaxy, with its global cluster systems. A lot of them have their own global clusters. If they form in some kind of isolation, you have the situation that they have um, the tidal radius far outside the, uh, the galaxy. You might have a global clusters. You might have already an in situ nuclei or you might actually form a nuclear star cluster by the massive global clusters that are falling due to dynamical friction in. Put this galaxy into a potential, into a galaxy cluster. So you, you, uh, there will be tidal forces. So they will develop these tidal tails and the outer global clusters will be lost. The tidal radius will shrink. Still some of the global clusters that are close to the to the core, to the center, might sink in because they don't feel still the tidal forces, but they feel still the dynamical friction. And after stripping, you would end up with an object that looks like a UCD, maybe has some remnant global cluster still around, and is free floating in the galactic potential. So um, there was already some observation hint that this uh, dynamical friction works to build at the nuclear star clusters because um, someone looked into dwarf ellipticals in the, in the Virgo cluster at the global cluster system. And they found out that the most massive global clusters are missing in the center of these galaxies, so they, and uh, the ones that have big nuclei. 
So maybe there is already a hint that um, some of the glo massive global clusters formed uh, the nucleus. So what I did with a student, uh, with another ESO student, is try to find whether in the Fornas cluster we have hundreds of UCDs that are confirmed. But we know also the uh, distribution of globular clusters uh, around the central galaxy. So I, I asked the question, do we find over densities of global clusters around the confirmed ultra-compact dwarfs? So these are the density distributions. We took an average of the density distribution and tried to find local over densities around the confirmed ultra-compact dwarfs. And our finding was very surprising. I didn't expect much. But so this is a aperture radius in kiloparsec around an ultra-compact dwarf in the Fornax cluster. And this is the over-density of blue and red, so metal-poor and metal-rich global clusters. And within one kiloparsec, we indeed found an over-density of especially the metal-poor global clusters, which are consistent with dwarf elliptical galaxies. And in many cases, you can point even to, to some very close objects to these UCDs that are not confirmed, but that are consistent in color with being global clusters. So we, we found uh, more or less significance that there are some objects of the UCDs that have a remnant global cluster system. We looked then also in the luminosity function of this uh, object that were found around here that have the right colors, and they are consistent with being drawn from a typical global cluster luminosity function around galaxies. So these are the nuclei, they have a high, high uh, luminosity. But this is a typical global cluster luminosity, and you see that the remnant objects are filling this very nicely, maybe even missing part of the brightest ones that are built the nucleus. And this was a nice confirmation that this way we might find stripped galaxies that have still some remnant global clusters. And this is a special case where we have a very big ultra-compact dwarf, and we have four or five objects around it that are consistent with global clusters, and I got just uh, a month ago Muse observations, eight hours on this object just, just for me, <laughs> uh, to confirm whether they are really related, and, and this would be really cool. Uh, we don't see a surface brightness envelope here. This might be, be you know, below the detection limit, but since global clusters pop up and uh, they are bright, they might confirm that these, these are related. And, and this would be really cool. In the same survey, we found also some, if you, if you uh, this were very, very nice force one images or force two images with a very good seeing. You could even do this game to subtract the PSF and see remnant, remnant envelopes. And in one of these envelopes is really big, and we, we see also tidal tails which are close to the orbit. Um, okay, and well, if you can resolve ultra compact dwarfs as it can be done with HST in the Virgo and Fornax cluster, you find indeed in some of them that they have envelopes. So they, have an, so they are not just one king profile or, or a surface profile, but then you need to, at least two to explain them. And you can make the game, um, if you have this in two colors, you can try to find out whether this, this uh, envelope has a color or a color gradient. And in some of them we find a positive color gradient, knowing that the, uh, the, the UCDs or the envelope getting redder than the nucleus, right? So, uh, so they, they are redder, which is consistent that you have an inner population that is maybe more metal poor and an outer one more metal rich, or the other way around, an inner population which is blue, it's a bit younger than the outer population. So at least you have two populations, which is a good hint also that this was not a normal global cluster. Okay, we can have uh, another observation indicator, which are the stellar population properties of the ultra-compact dwarfs themselves. So normally, this is a color magnitude diagram of global clusters as point sources around in the Fornax cluster. We have this typical situation that this is bimodal. We have a blue population, metal poor, and a metal uh, rich population, which is red. And um, so these are, these are what I would call the UCDs. You see that they bend towards the metal rich regime. If you on top of it would put nuclear star clusters still in galaxies, they are sitting here. So nicely overlapping with this region. These are even nuclear star clusters that are in, in a S0 galaxies, so, so in very massive galaxies. So some of the most massive UCDs might come from these progenitor galaxies. And we measured um, a lot of them with very high signal to noise spectra. 
together with another colleague, Thomas Putz here, and tried to get um, uh, stellar population properties via lick indices, right? You can uh, look for the magnesium, for the iron index, or uh, some kind of Balma lines, here in this case H gamma, and can then uh, make diagnostic plots where you put them onto uh, tracks of um, different alpha abundances or something like this, or uh, different ages, age and metallicity here, and can then identify some subgroups that might hint more to an extended star formation history because these are solar alpha over iron abundances, which we normally find only in, in nuclei typically, uh, or uh, that are even now st still youngish. So which would we also hint that they might have come from extended star formation history. The same was done in the Virgo cluster, even with some nuclei on top of it. So the dwarf elliptical nuclei have this typical solar alpha over iron abundances and uh, tend to be a little bit younger uh, than uh, some of the UCDs. And um, so this, this sounds a bit complicated, but this summarizes in principle everything, the comparison between nuclei and ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. So the UCDs are these green objects and measured nuclei are these black objects. Let's take, for example, so this is again with magnitude, the brighter one is now on the left side. So let's take age. What is a, the typical UCD is very old, which is consistent that it was stripped early, whereas a lot of nuclei go to younger ages. We know this. Then if you go to the metallicity, most of the UCDs are here. Uh, no, they, they, they have a spread, but a lot of them are metal poor, whereas a lot of nuclei are metal rich. Or the alpha over iron abundance, I said already that most of the nuclei have solar abundance, which would be at zero, but a lot of UCDs have global cluster-like alpha over iron abundances. And this is against distance. So, so uh, there was even one study that was so bold to try to fit from an integrated spectrum uh, a star formation history of a UCD and uh, was claiming that there is an extended star formation history. Uh, so these are typical single stellar population or multiple stellar population models you can make to integrated spectra. It was claiming that you find here an age spread between 10 and maybe even to, uh, down to 3, 4 giga years of this UCD. I'm a bit skeptical because this is only in the optical with uh, two small bands and there is no age uh, metallicity gradient whether this is really true. But in principle, you can try this game to get star formation histories. Okay, I come to my last part, which is maybe the most interesting here. Let's look for the supermassive black holes. Okay, so we have quite massive UCDs around uh, typically the Virgo cluster giant ellipticals and Fornax cluster giant ellipticals. So these are among the four, four most massive and extended ones where you can do this game of um, spatially resolved spectroscopy with in integral field spectroscopy, right? They have half-light radii of uh, 20 to 100 parsecs, masses of typically 10 to the 8. Okay. It was already known from before that if you put the log mass of the UCDs here, so 10 to 16 to 7, against their dynamical measurements of the dynamical mass against the stellar population mass, that a lot of these UCDs seems to be overweight. You can't explain the dynamical mass if you get an integrated velocity dispersion of a UCD. You can't explain it with a stellar population model, right? The stellar population mass was always too low, and this leads to a, a, a fraction of dynamic to population mass that is above one. So they seem to have some unseen matter, these UCDs. So this was, so, and we said, this can be due to different reasons. This can be a supermassive black hole, can be a strange IMF, a top heavy IMF, a bottom heavy IMF, or even some people say dark matter but it is so, so much in the center that it would be very difficult to, to put their dark matter. Um, anyway, we tr uh, so we tried to find out what it is. So what do you do to find a black hole? You have um, a projected radius, a velocity dispersion. If, uh, if the mass follows the light, you should have, a no with no black hole, you should get something like this. 
With a central black hole, you, should, uh, you get an increase in the very center of the velocity dispersion, right? So we applied for Symphony and NIFS at Gemini, so infrared telescopes, because it's easier to get a better spatial resolution at the moment, if you have mm -hmm. news. And, and simulated, that's what, what we would expect for these galaxies. There was, I must say, because this is historical, one, one attempt by my student, um, uh, Matthias Frank, he was at ESO at that time, where we tried it without uh, adaptive optics, just with Argo, seeing limited observations as well for the brightest uh, UCD in, um, in the Fornax cluster. This is the first one we discovered. And, 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 uh, but this, uh, we didn't get uh, enough spatial resolution to really confirm uh, or uh, disprove a black hole. We could only say that uh, everything above 5% of the UCD mass is ruled out as a black hole. So it, it seemed to have no black hole, but still it could be possible a black hole that makes up 5% of the, of, the, of, the, of the object mass. But with, with Gemini NIFS, we were more um, successful. So again, we, we look for this kind of sign here. Normally what you do is to look at the CO band heads here. And, and, and then uh, we have a really cl clear signal. We have a signal to noise of 60 or 40 here at this radii at, at the center, 0.4 arc seconds, where you can see that we can really nicely fit uh, the spectra. And then these are the maps and the models. So you see here a velocity map where you see some rotation in this uh, UCD and a very clear detection of a high velocity peak, velocity dispersion peak. And this is actually the model. This is Schwarzschild uh, orbit superposition model. But this would looks very amazingly uh, the same. So we could very nicely, we see this signal that it is, so this would be without a black hole the best fit. And this is with black hole the, uh, the best fit. And, and these are the constraints, uh, the sigma contours about the mass to light ratio, because there's always a degeneracy. You can play around with the mass to light ratio of the stellar population and the black hole mass. And we could confirm that this UCD, this was the first one with a confirmed black hole, has a supermassive black hole mass of 15% of the object. 15% of the object is in a black hole, in this very compact object. So how can this be? This is only possible in a nucleus of a galaxy, because we know in our Milky Way we have a nuclear star cluster of 10 to 7 and a black hole of uh, 10 to 6, something like 10 percent. So this fits more or less in this regime. So we did some simulations um, with a progenitor galaxy taking um, this uh, black hole bulge relation and nuclear cluster bulge relation, there are different relations that seem to be that the galaxy must be in this ballpark of, of mass before, 10 to the 10. And if you would disrupt it, you can indeed, within already one, two giga years, could get from a, from a galaxy profile to this UCD profile. And Holger Baumgart, a colleague of mine, made a nice um, simulation about this. So this is around this host galaxy. So if you throw in a nucleated dwarf elliptical and disrupt it with a very eccentric orbit, you can in principle get rid of the envelope and just be left with the nuclear star cluster, which will end up here where is the UCD today. Um, I was asked several times, shouldn't you see then still the, the, the tidal depris? But this is, uh, this is a process, uh, process of two giga years, and, and this has very, very low surface brightness. You would not expect to see this uh, so prominent. Then. OK. Just one short uh, comment back to the simulations. Uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we had these simulations with uh, Joel Pfeffer in these millennium uh, simulations. And in, in the analytical model, they gave also some black hole predictions. And actually, the, all these gray dots are our predictions for the black holes. And this was the first one measured. This is falls exactly in what, what we predicted as well, where, where it should be. So in the meantime, uh, especially this year, there came out uh, a lot of more measurements uh, in this, with the same groups. And I, I just summarize it here, because I'm now at the end of my time. So there were some recent black hole measurements of another three UCDs in the Virgo cluster. These are those ones with similar maps, with similar constraints, 
showing that two of them have again a very high mass fraction in a black hole, whereas one of them has only 2%. Then there is one black hole measurement of the first UCD in the Faunus cluster that was discovered. This is also in a detection of a 4% mass of the UCD, but only a three sigma result. We want to improve on it. And then we had, uh, these are all um, ultra compact walls above 10 to the 7 solar mass is really the most massive ones where you can do it. We did this in Centaurus A because it's closer also for some that are a bit less massive. So sen, big Sen A, globular clusters. And this was done with Symphony. Um, and we couldn't, uh, we get, could get only upper limits, but we could nearly exclude one black hole in one of these global clusters and get another constraints on the other one. You see here that there, is not, there might be a hint of an increase in the center here, but here definitely not. So you get, you get some upper limits of black holes. So at, at this regime, Omega Centauri to 10 to the 7, they might be not all having a black hole at all. Okay, so this is a current situation of this plot where you have this dynamical against population mass. As I said, they were all up here, but if you correct for the black hole, they get all nicely down to the same regime and you can explain the stellar populations uh, of, of these objects. Okay, I come to my summary. So, um, so UCDs are defined through an upper end of the mass size relation. You saw this and have some enhanced dynamical mass to light ratio, which occurs more or less at omega centauri mass. They share the properties with nuclear star clusters in various aspects or with young massive star clusters. So they, they might not be all stripped galaxies, but a mixed bag of objects. The stripping in cosmological simulations can explain the process that you get stripped nuclei, but only you expect only 40% of the, so you have not enough dwarf galaxies to explain all the ones we observe. Uh, so far, five UCDs have a confirmed black hole mass, which makes up to 2 to 18% of the UCD mass. So this is the direct evidence on the best. And we have some with extended envelopes and accreted nuclear star clusters. I think, thank you. <laughs> I leave this a little bit because this summarizes everything. So there, there are, uh, are the, the plots. Time for some questions now. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, I have several questions, but I'll try to summarize one of them. So, you have used several simulations in order to yes. explain several phenomena. Yes. All right. The first one was a cosmological one, right? Yes. Okay. So, in this cosmological simulation, it's possible to predict the number of blood holes that should be already obtained in the stripping uh, uh, phenomenon? Yes, this is the principle. I flipped a little bit over this this plot. So there is a, so there at the moment the Aquarius and other simulations, but this was still at the Millennium simulations, and there was okay. a semi-analytical model from Gu et al. who predicted the black holes that uh, related to each of the galaxies in the simulations. So what what we did here, we took here only the ones that got, got stripped, that got totally merged, stripped. And this is basically the, the black hole that is related to that galaxy in a similar analytical model. So this is uh, the mass of the black hole mm -hmm. compared uh, uh, to the, because we, what we did new, we assigned also a nuclear star cluster to that galaxy, uh -huh. to the okay. galaxy with, a, with a typical mass range they have in observations. So we, what we here do, compare the remnant nuclear UCD mass with the predicted black hole mass from the original galaxy where it came from and, and find this relation. And, and this is one of the measured ones. And these are inferred from the high mass to light ratio dynamically mm -hmm. defined. This, these are basically inferred from uh, observations, but not real observations. So just inferred from an elevated mass to light ratio. So that's what, that's what we can do in principle. Okay, okay. And so the uh, velocity dispersion you are obtaining for the uh, UCDs or yeah. radio observer are also compatible with the expected uh, velocity dispersion obtained from this simulation? And not only for the uh, black hole, but for the other one with no black holes in the, in the, in the center? Um. I, I don't know whether they have the resolution in the simulations to predict a velocity dispersion of the stars in, in the very centers, because they have a... I don't know. 
no, uh, my question. Don't they, don't um, so they don't have a, a, some kind of a velocity dispersion for the final product of the stripping? No. No. Not in the simulation. Not what in the simulation. So is that what we compared, what, what I written, which I did not show, you have the orbits of the stripped uh -huh. galaxies. And you have the radial velocity of the orbits, and you can take all stripped galaxies and look what is their velocity dispersion in the environment, in the galaxy cluster. I see. And we compare the velocity dispersion of the observed UCDs also with the velocity <coughs> dispersion you predict okay. from the orbits of the, the, uh, the stripped galaxies, yeah. and that fits also more or less. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Very nice talk. Um, do you think is, there is any way of relating the possibility of, of uh, the population of ultra-compact dwarf galaxies and clusters explaining some, at least some of the diffuse light in distant clusters of galaxies? Yes. So we, we, we made this calculation that the disrupted galaxies can actually explain this uh, very uh, extended CD halo in, in the Vero cluster and uh, also in the Fonas cluster. This is more or less consistent because these are always uh, more or less um, the progenitor galaxies of most of them are, have 10 to the 10 solar masses, whereas the giant ellipticals are much more massive, 10 to the 13 or 10 to 12, 13. So you can hide a lot of 10 to the 10, uh, the stellar envelopes, in this intercluster light, in this um, CD halo light. It's more or less consistent to make the, this calculation. Yeah. Thank you. Pass through the microphone, please, Jaime. Um, yeah, so you were talking all the time about Virgo and Fornax, and I was wondering if there is another galaxy cluster you could find this UCDs. Yes. Um, yes. So I talk about because it's a the best studied samples we have, the Fornax cluster and Virgo cluster, because they are still close by within tw uh, 20 megaparsecs, but they were found even at a coma cluster distance, also in the coma cluster with uh, ACS. Uh, uh, HST photometry, they, they were confirmed, and some were confirmed, but you find them also around some rare uh, group galaxies, uh, astonishingly uh, bright globular clusters you find find in even group galaxies. So, so one uh, cluster, yeah, if there is a difference in number of UCDs that you find in coma, for example, that it's older. We did this game not for uh, for the coma cluster, but for the Hydra and Centaurus cluster to f look for a specific frequency of UCDs compared to a specific frequency of global clusters, which is more or less scales with the environment. So there's a relation between the number of global clusters with the environment, with the, with the galaxy. And we did not see any trend. So in, in general, the more massive uh, environments have also more massive UCDs can have more massive UCDs, but there is not an really over-density, so the, the scaling goes uh, linear. Not, there's not an over-density of much more uh, massive UCDs compared to... Uh, like the older the cluster is, the more UCDs you find? We try to find, uh, but this is in the beginnings, whether there are some young UCDs. You can um, basically say that the Virgo cluster is, has a younger dynamical history, that maybe if they are come from strip nuclei, the, the nucleus was still forming stars, so the, the, the age of the strip nuclei should be in basically younger than in the Fornax cluster. I think, um, I don't know, uh, let's see whether I have this slide here. Oh, yes. There is a small hint. Do we see this? Uh, why not? Here. Yeah. So, okay. So this is look back time. This is uh, compared to our simulations. Look back time, and there is an average age here of the UCD. They are they are basically all old. What what comes out from line indices? They are 10 to 12 giga years. But we can in between the Fornax and the Virgo cluster see a small <laughs> difference. But this goes not in the right direction, actually. So the Virgo cluster seems to have older UCDs than the Fornax cluster, but, but this makes it. So, but, but at these ages, I would not. 
care much. But, but what we did as well is, I can you show this here, with Thomas Putzer, actually we, we had these 60 very high signal to noise UCDs, in, this is only in the Fornax cluster, but we see that there is an age spread that we even find very massive objects that are only five, three, five giga years old. And, and this is very strange, and we have to follow them really up uh, what this means, uh, to have these young objects that seem to be quite metal rich, where they could come from. So they must have still had star formation three, five giga years ago in the Fornax cluster. So they must have come from some galaxy that came in late, let's say.